afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here in this beautiful country where I have always enjoyed the paradox of chaos and then spirituality. <laughs> my travels here, this is my 18th visit to the Brahma Kumaris and I've been studying with the BKs for about 28 years now. From my first visit, I came here first of all as a as a guest to a retreat similar to this, and um, they and they sort of net, they put a net on me, and I've been caught ever since. The um, one of the things that I've done in my life, I've I've I had a kind of period when I was training in oncology, which is chemotherapy of cancer treatment. Um, but during the process of that training, I became much more connected to the empathy, the desire to understand the feelings of people going through cancer, and what their experience was like, and how it was like to be diagnosed with that condition. And this led to me uh, actually spending much more time listening to people. I don't know if you've, if you, I think one of the uh, qualities of, I, I don't, I never really thought of myself as a leader, but I think one of the qualities of leadership is the ability to listen, to try to understand where people are coming from and what's in their heart and soul. What happened was, um, as I started to try to understand the experience of people going through a cancer diagnosis, from the diagnosis through the treatment, through the unfortunate situation of recurrent disease and incurable disease, and then the process that takes place of uh, progressing disease, um, suffering, distress, loss of independence, uh, the inability to be the person that we used to be at the beginning of all of this and the change that takes place when we lose our health. Um, the simple act of listening did so much good for people. They, they felt so much better after talking to me and they started to say nice things about me, how nice it was to talk to this doctor. And it made me realize actually a very simple thing that the, the human interest, the connection to people's stories is, is so important to them and it's so healing to have someone actually spend time listening, not necessarily giving advice, not necessarily fixing, not necessarily um, coming up with solutions, but actually the ability just to give your pure attention to someone else's situation and to allow them the time and opportunity to speak their, speak their experience, to go through the feelings that they're in. Um, one of the beautiful kind of things that happened to me at that time was I, as I discovered a, a lady called Elizabeth Kuba Ross who did work on death and dying through the 70s and 80s. And she ran workshops worldwide. And I went to one of these workshops where I had a really, um, really remarkable experience of awakening, I guess. I, she used to take you into those places. Within us, we carry unfinished business. Now, the unfinished business that we have inside us is are the things that have happened in our lives that have caused pain or sorrow or suffering to us and have created defense systems that we have, such as anger, to, over, to overcome um, the threat of grief and sorrow in our lives. And in this workshop, I broke down and all these defenses broke down. And I found myself in a workshop situation, um, crying for things that happened in my early childhood. And, and as I cried, um, my defense system became, I became defenseless. My ego disappeared temporarily. And, that, and as the ego disappeared, something very beautiful happened. I started to experience, even while the, while the tears were still on my face, I started to experience this feeling of emptiness but the emptiness wasn't really empty it was like a space that had opened up inside and the emptiness filled with this remarkable sense of peace just a beautiful peace um, that felt liberated from the world it felt like the world disappeared and I felt myself becoming incredibly peaceful uh, liberated totally free and in that moment blissful sort of released into bliss. And in that blissful moment, um, I felt these this waves and waves and waves and waves of unconditional pure love. Just a, 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 but a love that wasn't for 
special relationships. It was a love of oneness. I felt as if you were all there. Everyone was there. Everyone and everything was inclusive in this feeling of love. There was no sense of separation from anything or anyone. All of nature, all, all spiritual souls, every single part of humanity was in there. It reminded me that sometimes I'm kind of joke with, joke with my sort of junior doctors who train under me now because I was a junior doctor then. Um, and now they've got these people training under me. I sometimes tell them, you know, that you, you've, you've actually got to look beyond what you're seeing to start to feel your way into people's worlds. Uh, because we're all the same underneath. Underneath, when we, when we release the things that make us seem different, the things that create e the ego structure, the, those things we've been hearing about today, like roles, the things we do, and the, the association of self with those things that we're not, as, we, as soon as we become lots of selves that we're not, and, we, and we're running between all of those identities, we become confused, actually, because the thing that gets lost is who am I really, my real self. It's like, it's like I lose touch with who I am, and who I am really loses touch with my mind. So my, my real self is no longer in my mind. It's trapped. I've become trapped in this sense of self that's built up around different things, the things, the body, the body consciousness, the roles, the role consciousness, all of these things that separate me from who I really am. When I came to the Brahma Kumaris, it was at the end of a, about seven years later, I'd been studying different spiritual things, now taking up meditation, because I felt and believed deep in my heart that that moment when I became liberated and peaceful and blissful at the same time, and felt myself in these waves and waves and waves of love. Actually, actually it, lasted me for, it lasted for three weeks. I was a junior doctor and I went back to the hospital and I was in love with everybody. I was in love with all the nurses, I was in love with the doctors, I was in love with the patients, I was in love with the flowers and the trees. Uh, it's just love was all that defined me. And, and at the time I had a, I, I, I was in a, what do you call it, um, uh, a conflict with my supervisor, which wasn't good for my sort of, um, as a trainee, it wasn't actually good for my career prospects at the time. But when I saw him, I felt this overwhelming sentiment of feeling of love, and I said to him, I love you. <laughs> that wasn't my best career move to date either. He got the team psychiatrist to see me. Uh, so the one who is in love needs to see a psychiatrist. Um, but the psychiatrist was a wonderful find because he was a deeply Christian soul and he was the head of psychiatry at a teaching hospital in Sydney. Um, and he took me aside and he, he, and he offered me 12 months of personal supervision, which was a way of actually developing yourself as a doctor with your, your empathy and communication and compassion and, and nature of compassion, how to apply that in practice. And he saw, I spent a, a day a week for the next 12 months with him. It was a fabulous sort of opportunity. And it's interesting, isn't it? When, you're, when, you, when, you're, when you, the, the right time is there for you to open up, it's like the whole universe lines up with you. It's ready to actually guide you and the, the right things happen, the right people are there and you, the right book or the right person will actually be the next step on your journey. And this is what happened to me. I, just, I was very innocent. I didn't really question anything. I just kept moving, moving forwards. Um, one of the things that started to really resonate with me with the Brahma Kumaris when I came here was one, the... The, the aspect that my real nature is peace and I'm the soul. So I already knew that I was eternal because the, body, the experience of love I had was a completely bodiless sensation of being out of the, being free of the body, yet still in it, but free of the body, no, no bodily feelings, and a sense of self that was expanded, like, it, like it, it was a feeling of self that contained everyone. We were all together. There was no separation. The separation illusion had disappeared, and the oneness factor was there. Um, so that that deep that deep understanding that I was a soul was already there, and I believed that that I'd been fed, that my experience was actually an experience of God, and it was the first time in my life I'd experienced God. I wasn't a religious person. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't seeking anything. I wasn't trying to find myself. I wasn't doing anything like that. It just 
I just stumbled into it and fell into myself. Um, and and one of the when I came here, I started to practice this uh, this yoga, this quality of yoga. I am a soul. Yoga is my remembrance of God. Reminds me on a daily basis of the power and purity and truth and love of my soul. And my so my love for God is my soul God relationship of that. And I started to, and there was this kind of framework. I was working, okay, as an oncologist, and I wanted to understand more about death and dying. And here I come to this place where there's um, this, this phrase called dying alive. Die alive. And, and as I studied meditation more and the practice of meditation, I started to recognize and realize that the dying process that I sometimes see out in the world where people are suffering from cancers or other health problems, where the, where the dying becomes a process. It's not just like a, I went to sleep one night and didn't wake up the next morning, which is what most of us pray for. But um, well, I don't know if any of us pray for that, but, but that's the way most people would say they would like to die quickly. But this is more like the dying process. The dying process, when it's more, more of a protracted over time, it involves change and transformation and potential opportunity to feel and experience the self as the self is. And there is such a thing as a beautiful death. I mean, that sounds like a weird combination of syllables, but there is such a thing as a beautiful death. Um, but the struggle is there, and, and, and the struggle is when the ego is being broken down. When you can't do the things that you used to be able to do that make you feel who you are, it's like an identity crisis. Uh, you can no longer follow the interests that you have. You can't be the same person in the family you were before. You're more dependent. People have to look after you, whereas you looked after everybody before. So your sense of self gets changed. It gets challenged. And me that mental and emotional suffering that happens in the process is trying to hang on to what I used to be. I'm trying to hold on to the memory of who I was when, I, when that's being forcibly taken away from me. I can't be the person I was, and I'm desperate to try to be like that. So people go through a whole range of emotions, anger, sadness, frustration, um, everything, you know, like a churning emotional journey. Um, but But there's some beautiful things that can start to happen. When a person can't do the things they used to be able to do and they're very frustrated um, and, they're, and they're numbering all the things they can't do and why they're frustrated, and I'm, I'm listening to them and asking them um, about that. Um, I found there's always a flip side to it. And, that, and the flip side to it is the other side of that coin is, listen, when you, now you, you can't do all those things, you have to spend more time in bed lying down or in a chair. When you're lying down, how do you feel? I feel normal. And when you're feeling normal lying down, do you feel comfortable? Yes, I feel comfortable. And when you're lying down feeling comfortable and normal, do you feel peaceful? Do you ever have periods of extended peaceful feelings? Yes, I have very extended periods of feeling very peaceful. It's, it's the other side. I can't do the things I could do before that gave me a quality of life. But I'm being the being that I've always been. And I'm, and I'm settling back into this more egoless state. Um, and, uh, and it's a state of normal, my original nature is coming through. It's, I sometimes feel it's a bit like the quality of innocence is rising again. And as a person accepts that these are things... Here, there are clues here about the things that you can do that we do a bit more of on the spiritual path because the spiritual path can be challenging because there's the old way and there's the new way. There's what I've awoken to and there's, what, and there's, and there's the pleasures of when I was sleeping. And, and sometimes the, the things you can, you can do is the ego keeps trying to pull you back um, to, what you, to where your desires have been. Whereas you, whereas you have a deep wish to move forwards um, the feeling of being the soul, the pure being, all of those beautiful kind of qualities that we've been talking about today that can seem so elusive and far away and hard to grasp. 
hard to put into practice, hard to transform, hard to change myself. And it can become, fr- and the spiritual journey can become frustrating and tiring sometimes because of that. But, but what does a dying person show us? What, what they show us is that I've got, a, I've got a piece of paper here that says Hindi, please. <laughs> it's just not, not possible. <laughs> Except I can say Om Shanti. <laughs> Om Shanti. I can't just sit here saying Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti all the time. Uh, but um, one of the things, what, 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 did, what can I learn from the dying from the person who's dying, going through the dying process. When someone starts to accept, they let go. When they start to accept and go into more acceptance, um, what does acceptance have? Acceptance has the remarkable quality of peace. It's a very beautiful state of being. Um, When there's acceptance, there's peace, and, uh, and there's an expansion around the person. There's a fearlessness inside them. They don't have any fear in their eyes. The acceptance is there. It's not like giving up, but it's more like it's more like the right quality at the right time, um, where the acceptance allows that person to to feel and experience their own peace, and they start to smile. They're not accepting death. They're just. But it's not. This isn't accepting death. This is acceptance of the moment I'm in now. Which might be the might be the dying it might be include the dying process, but it's acceptance of the moment I'm in now, this moment now, right now, and in that acceptance is is it lets go of the whole of my past is let go of, past is gone, it's not there, and I, when as I let go in acceptance, I let go of the future. Sometimes people have trouble letting go, and they say I'm trying to let go, and sometimes in their spiritual journey. And I sometimes suggest, forget about letting go of the past, just let go of the future and live in acceptance of the present. And that includes letting go of the past because it's not about going through all the stuff and trying to move all the bad stuff and the dark stuff. It's about actually sitting in the light of who you really are and practicing to, be, to hold that light. Because this state of acceptance is also a state of love. A very pure, beautiful uniting love, um, the uncommon love that f- has the feeling and experience of oneness and connectedness. I've had um, countless people come and tell me the stories of their, because of, I go and talk about death and dying, and so everyone afterwards comes and tells me about how their mother died or their father died. So I keep listening to all these stories, like, <laughs> all these death and dying stories. Uh, but it's my own folks I talk about it, so I've brought it on. The... Um, but the, but I can remember um, a volunteer once telling me that when her mother died, it was just so beautiful. She said the, the room wasn't just full of peace, it was full of love. If she could feel the light of the spirit in that whole peaceful, loving feeling in the place. Um, and she said, when I looked into my mother's eyes, it felt like I just felt myself getting lost in that feeling of her peace and where she was, and where she was going, and that she was going beyond this body, and I could feel myself being pulled into this place beyond the body with her. It was like I was going with her. It was just beautiful. Um, and this is what lies within all of us. So these, these are not kind of gurus and teachers, but they are teachers, aren't they, in a sense? But they're not gurus, they're not there telling you the stories. They're actually living the experience and they're unf- and it's showing that when the ego dissolves, what's left behind? No identity, no sense of self. So the soul conscious state isn't, doesn't, isn't like a, an identity or a sense of self. I know who I am and I know who others are and I can feel the soul and the spirit in everyone but, but there's, the ego is gone, so there's no sense of self built up around anything. I'm not holding on to anything. I've let go. So my acceptance and letting go, if you were to practice those two things as you journey on your spiritual path, as you practice your yoga and, try, and that c- 
that deep, beautiful connection with God. As you sit quietly in that yoga that actually keeps connecting you to the soul awareness of who you are, let go and accept the moment that's beautiful. Let go and accept the moment that's beautiful. You don't have to struggle and battle with all the weaknesses and the thoughts that are against you that seem to be building up and separating you from the experience you want to have. Just accept yourself as you are. And if, there are, if there's a struggle there, accept the struggle. It's a weird thing because when, when there's a struggle there internally, we don't accept it. We try to move away from it or, or get rid of it or do something about it, um, which means it controls us. The struggle controls us. If I accept the struggle, if I accept the weakness, if I accept the problem about myself, it can't control me. So the power of acceptance is it, nothing, whatever you accept cannot control you. It has no control over you. Um, and, this I, and, and one thing that doesn't ever accept anything is the ego. The ego doesn't accept anything at all. So acceptance undoes the ego. It undoes, it undoes the interference, the static that interferes with knowledge. Just, just accept, let go, and feel the peace and the purity of who you really are. Um, and people who are dying don't actually, don't actually meditate. They rarely meditate. Some of them do, but it's not, not common. Uh, some of them don't have very many beliefs, actually. In, in the West, a lot of people don't believe in God or the soul. Um, and yet, uh, yet uh, you find that people with beliefs can actually have a beautiful kind of experiences towards the end of life. But there are plenty of people with no beliefs who also find peace, just, just because that's the process where they can't be anything other than the peace that they are. It doesn't mean to say that they understand that or know what it means or, or how to put it into practice. And they haven't attained it, they haven't made any effort for it, but it's been their karma to experience it. It's been their fortune to experience it, and probably it's much better to leave the body in that state than struggling. Every now and again in my professional life, I have the privilege of being able to make a difference to some somebody. and. One of the differences that it makes to a lot of people is just to be able to sit down and explain their illness to them so they can understand what's going on. You can sometimes give people a prognosis, like you're not going to live for very long, but if they don't know why, they're going to resist that and be angry about the idea of it. Um, but if you, if, you, if you pay attention to what people need from you and you as a doctor, and you give the time to explain the illness, the disease, and why they're feeling the way they're feeling, and why their health is deteriorating before you start talking about prognosis. So you educate and help people understand, which means you, trans you transfer the power of your knowledge to them. So you're empowering them and giving them a sense of control over their situation because you're giving them knowledge about it. You haven't changed it, you haven't, and they're not in more control, but the sense of control is greater. If the sense of control is greater, then the, then, the, then the power to face the situation is, is much greater and people feel more confident and more comfortable about the process that they're in. So I, could, so I will do that to, with every patient I see and every family. So it's a family, it's not just a person who's dying, it's a whole family that's affected by that. I'll spend my time with the whole family as well and, and explain everything to everybody and answer all of their questions to the best of my ability. Um, and this, this is kind of, that's the kind of, you know, compassion needs to have an action side to it, not just a feeling. You know, empathy is to listen, uh, to adjust yourself to different people and to understand and to do your best to understand what's happening for them. And compassion is a response to that. It's the action side of it, where the caring and the loving and the feeling of wanting to help and support someone. But I, I'll tell you a story of a patient I had who, who was, um, who is also, a, and I said, all of these stories and are little examples of what we can do as well to help ourselves on our spiritual journey. Each one of these is not just about a patient, it's about something that happened or that, that was significant 
in their journey that could be significant in ours as well. And this was a this was a man who was an alcoholic, who developed liver cancer, um, and he was very he was very very sick and weak and wasted by his disease. He could barely he could barely walk by the time he came into hospital, um, and he was found actually on his on the floor in his house after collapsing. Was brought to hospital where he was no where he was completely bed bound, um, and very sick. But he was very independent. I mean, really stubbornly independent. Didn't want any help from anybody. Didn't want the nurses to help him. Um, didn't want any any advice from anybody. Didn't take any medications that were prescribed. Just he just wanted everyone to go away. Um, and he had no friends, no visitors, no family. His children had abandoned him years before because uh, I don't know why, but you don't know the history of everybody. But uh, but but our sort of very strong alcoholic history does to suggest maybe abuse could have taken place, but he didn't have anybody to support him. When I went to see him, he was lying in a bed. Um, all, the, all, the, um, all the curtains, there were four beds in the, in the room, you know, like you go into these hospitals. In, in, in Australia, you might get four beds in a room. In India, you might get 40. But, there's, but there was four beds in a room, and, and he was behind the curtains in one of the beds, and I, I opened the curtains to walk in. And it was quite clear he didn't want me there. He was turned away. He didn't make any eye contact. His body language was like was was saying, "Go away! Don't come near me." Um, and and I introduced myself as Dr. Cole. My name call me Roger. I'm and I work from I'm from palliative care. Um, and he he did he didn't engage at all. He was totally angry and and dismissive. His, his, the energy in that room was horrible. You didn't. You felt like you were an intruder, and that uh, that you were like an enemy come to come into someone else's space. Um, so I couldn't do very much for him. So all, all I could do was tell him what was going on and where he was going next. So I t he he was going to be moved from the ward, the acute hospital ward, to a palliative care ward where he could die, where he was going to die. And he probably wasn't going to live for more than a, a week or two from how weak he looked to me at that point. So I just told him these things that, um, that we're going to move him from this ward to another ward. Um, and, and as I turned away, I, was going, I was just got to the curtains. I was just letting myself out. And I thought to myself, what a terrible way to die. What an awful place to die from, that emotional space. So I... I turned around and I went back to I went back to him. All the curtains were drawn so nobody could see me, and I put a hand I put my hand on, on his heart as he lay in the bed, and I said to him, "I am so sorry, my friend, that you are so sick and so weak. You can't even walk, so we want to look after you, and we'll look after you as a brother and a friend." And and as I said, we'll look after you as a brother and a friend. His eyes teared up and he put his he put one, he put both of his hands over, my hand was over his heart, he put both of his hands on my hands, and I put my other hand on top of his, and he just teared up in his, in his face. Um, anyway, he, he was put on, on, the, on a bed list to, for transfer to the other hospital, but then, tra then came under my care. And I, I went back to see him two days later, and he was a different person. He was quite. He was very. He was very, very weak and very wasted. And when he spoke, he he spoke in a in a whisper. You could. I had to lean forward to hear what he was saying. And I said to him, "You look so much different than the other day. What's happened?" And he said, "After you spoke to me about palliative care, I was just thinking and thinking about palliative care." And he said, and I was thinking about all my problems and all my problems, and I was thinking about palliative care, and I was thinking of all my problems. And then I had this thought, just came into, just came, just came into my mind. And I said, and he, he paused, and I went, what was it? <laughs> and he said, nothing matters. Nothing matters. And I said to him, so your problems have all gone away. And he said, no, my problems are still there, but they don't matter. Nothing matters. 
and he was at peace. Whatever his history was, whatever his story was, whatever his guilt was, whatever, whatever his trauma was, it was all released. On, on, on one simple thought, nothing matters. It's such, a, it's such a deep and beautiful thought, isn't it? State of acceptance, letting go, nothing matters. Just allowing things to be the way they are. Not so, and one of the deep, beautiful things that I feel is that we can create heaven from within ourselves in our lives, through our karma, through our thoughts, our words, our actions. We can, we can create hell through our, through, in our lives through those same things, through the quality of our thoughts, words, and actions. Um, and one of the things that I was reflecting on in terms of leadership from all of this you know, this question of nothing matters. Underneath it all, there's a pure state of being. And these are not, these are not gurus and teachers, okay? These are, these are just regular people going through a process called dying, where the ego, where they become egoless for some reason. Some people have found the egoless state has come at a point, at a deep point of despair, like in the deepest place of depression, at the bottom out of depression. Some people are so are so devoid of ego when they get so deeply depressed that, that they receive their light at that point and they suddenly find themselves liberated. I'm not I'm not suggesting you go on the path of depression to liberation in life, but uh, but it, but it can happen at a time when when the ego is actually dis, dis, divorced and destroyed by something, and the dying process destroys ego. But what about creating heaven from within ourselves. And I was contemplating this the other day, and I was thinking about what heaven looks like, what heaven, how heaven is depict, depicted. I was thinking that we see it sometimes images of the Golden Age or the Garden of Eden, that, that a time of a very pure quality of human existence on this, this earth. <clears throat> and one of the things that I really like about that image is it that whether in whether from the eastern pictures or the western pictures, they depict the set, one image that's similar, and that is the the lamb and the lion together. That the lion, the lamb and the lion coexist in heaven. Uh, there's no there's no danger. There's no fear. There's no there's no there's nothing. There's no um, victimization. There's nothing there, and it's very symbolic because the lion is courage and strength and the capacity not to be influenced or affected by others and to stand in your own space with strength and courage. Whereas the lamb depicts innocence, sweetness and gentleness and purity. And that these two things can coexist. And the true and the true balanced spirit or soul has both power and innocence working side by side. The purity of innocence and the power and strength of knowing myself as I am and for who I am. And it's that, it's that balance of those, the balance of those qualities that, that is heavenly in, in its creation. So as I go forward and as I've gone forward over, the, over recent years, as I've studied Raj Yoga and I've applied the soul conscious, beautiful state of being when I'm sitting down with patients and families, I'm not teaching them anything, but I'm actually not influenced or affected by what they're going through, which doesn't mean to say I'm not empathic. It means I'm, I connect and I don't distance myself because I've got problems inside me of my own losses or my own unfinished business, my own anger and stuff that I'm carrying that will actually get caught up in the relationship with a somebody who's very, very distressed or not upset because I'll connect to their upsetness and be affected by it, it'll upset me. Um, so to be, in a way, to sit and stay in my own truth is to be the lion. But to, to reach out with sweetness and gentleness to help adjust their experience and to do the appropriate thing for them at that point in time is the lamb. The lion holds the lamb. It's, it's, it's like, in a sense, it's not being detached, and yet it's detachment in the purest sense of the word. So I, I would never suggest you be detached.
but but stay but if you sit in your own truth you are detached in the purest sense of the word because you're not influenced by what's not real and what's not real here is that dying isn't real it doesn't exist it's it's a just a change it's a moment of change where on my journey in life um, so it's a sweet kind of, and there can be a very sweet side to it would you like me to take this into a short meditation I'll take these sentiments into a short meditation five, five minutes five minutes and in, in, it, won't be, it won't be in Hindi either So, sitting comfortably and quietly, I allow myself to spend time with myself, to be gentle with myself, to let go of fear and worry, to allow myself to be present and comfortable in this space to let go and to calm myself down to relax myself deeply and completely free of the world nothing I have to think or worry about the world is very distant and far away the roles that I play dissolve into space. I am free of the roles that I play. I am just me, myself, sitting quietly, loving myself, being myself, connecting to the deepest, purest, most loving part of myself. I sit quietly and deeply within. And I feel the thought that nothing matters. That nothing matters. And in the thought of nothing matters, I feel a freedom my spirit, allowing myself to open my heart to love, allowing myself to open my mind to peace, allowing myself to open my being to power, allowing myself to feel the innocence of purity, the gentleness of spirit, and the power of the presence of my true self, sitting in the light and purity of God, the one who knows me deeply, and loves me purely and truly for who I am. I let go. And become one. With the beautiful source of love and truth and power. I surrender myself with deep acceptance. Nothing separating me from anyone. A oneness, a wonderful feeling of lightness and gentleness. I am the love that I seek. I am the truth that I understand. I am the peace. 
I am. Shanti.